Um, yes, th thank you very much for this invitation to uh, speak to you in this, uh, in this, uh, to this audience. And um, I would like to share with you some uh, aspects related to antibody-mediated immunotherapy in the coming uh, 20 minutes. And uh, I would like to start off to give you some background information related to um, this uh, approach and then share with you some, uh, some uh, aspects that uh, we developed within the SIOP N group, uh, first in the relapse refractory setting, and then um, how this impacts also to the, to the frontline use, and at the end share with you some ideas related to future plans uh, with this approach. So the uh, target uh, that uh, is um, being discussed here is the ganglios IgD2. Uh, you have heard about this, uh, I'm sure. And uh, this antigen is, antigen is uh, unique in this respect that it's not a protein, but it's a glycolipid. So it's a certain structure that is on the cell surface of a neuroblastoma. And it lacks any signaling domain into the uh, intracellular space, which means that unlike other antibodies that you may have heard of uh, uh, for other cancer treatments, uh, this antibody does not block a signaling pathway or a growth signal or something like that. It simply is there for the antibody to bind. And then it induces an immune response uh, against uh, the tumor cell. So, so it's a pure um, antigen on the cell surface uh, that does not have any specific um, uh, growth function or signaling function uh, to the cell. This is important. Um, the ganglioside GD2 is expressed on quite a variety of different uh, tumors, um, and in neuroblastoma we find it to 100% uh, of uh, the cases with this disease. And since this is a very unique um, feature of neuroblastoma cells in the body, uh, this is a very suitable target for immunotherapies in general, and in particular for antibodies, which will be the topic of, the, uh, of this talk. Now, the mechanism of action, as far as we understand, of Cameric 1418 is uh, related to the fact that there is no disruption of a growth signal, but it's purely the induction of an immune response. And there are three major mechanisms that we know of uh, that all require the patient's immune system uh, to work. So um, the first step certainly is the binding of the antibody to the tumor cell, but then you need uh, cells of the patient uh, to actually do the job and recognize the antibody which is bound to the tumor cell, uh, which then eventually releases toxic granules to kill, uh, uh, in this case, um, uh, neuroblastoma. There are some other me mechanisms that are important related to the complement system, which we can uh, measure in vitro uh, that uh, it relates to proteins in the serum uh, of a patient which cluster to form a so-called membrane attack complex, which then also kills the neuroblastoma. So you need cells and you also need the serum um, to uh, be very uh, effective. Another thing I'd like to share with you is um, uh, the information that these antibodies that uh, we are working with um, 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 are, are not necessarily always the same. And uh, this is even more clear for uh, two versions of Cameric 1418. Um, and uh, this is Cameric 1418, uh, which has been, uh, which needs to be produced. Antibodies need to be produced by uh, certain production cell lines. Um, and we have two different versions of this, um, of this antibody, which is the same protein sequence, but produced in different cell lines. <clears throat> and when, when we look at, at certain glycosylation um, characteristics uh, of these proteins, you can see that these are completely different. Um, and um, this translates also into quite distinct uh, different efficacies against uh, uh, neuroblastoma. If, you, if we look in, uh, in, in a Petri dish and, and analyze the amount of antibody that you need to kill 50% of, of tumor cells, you see that um, the, the different versions of the Chimeric 1418 perform quite differently. In other words, um, the blue uh, curves represent a quite more active um, um, uh, response against neuroblastoma compared to the antibody in the green curve, uh, just to make it clear that, um, that this um, shows that, that um, we are not always um, talking about uh, the same thing if we speak about monoclonal antibodies directed against GD2. 
Um, so in this case, we have a, uh, in this particular essay a, ten, a, buck, a factor tenfold difference um, mediating this um, certain response in vitro. Now, um, let's move into the, um, into the real application of this antibody. And there's uh, been extensive work by ma uh, various groups related uh, to the use of chimeric 1418 in neuroblastoma. And I'd like to uh, just uh, bring out some uh, two important um, uh, st studies. The first one is, uh, has been done within the GPOH a long time ago. Um, and in this uh, study, chimeric 1418 has been given uh, to children uh, with neuroblastoma after uh, induction and high-dose chemotherapy. <clears throat> and in an initial analysis uh, done in, in 2004, followed by a um, reinvestigation in 2011, um, it becomes clear that uh, in a uh, retrospective analysis, uh, children that received uh, chimeric 1418 had a better um, overall survival compared uh, to children that did not get uh, this particular antibody. This was not a randomized study, so the, the quality and the robustness of this uh, data was not as good as the ones that uh, has been done by um, Alice Yu and the COG. Uh, we have seen this slide before. But here um, we have uh, a, a particular information that needs to be taken into account, which is the fact that the antibody has been given in combination with cytokines. So it has been combined with interleukin-2 and GMCSF. <coughs> And it was a, a randomized study which showed really for the first time in such a, a randomized setting that this type of immunotherapy um, improved the uh, overall survival uh, of patients that received uh, this type of uh, treatment over a standard um, treatment, which is the 13 cis retinoic acid. And, and these two pieces of information, I think, are really uh, important uh, because they provide evidence for clinical e efficacy of this antibody alone but also in combination with, uh, with cytokines. Now, um, the application of anti-GD2 antibodies is not without problems. Um, and uh, we know that there is one very distinct on-target effect. On-target means that um, when the antibody sees ganglioside GD2, there is a certain specific side effect that occurs, which is the induction of pain. And all the children that have received and parents that uh, um, had children on such trials, they know um, uh, this, this problem, uh, and it has to do with the fact that the ganglioside GD2 is also expressed on pain fibers um, of, the, um, of the nerve system. Uh, so there's nothing you can really do about uh, this, this problem uh, that it occurs, but what can you need to do is to uh, give appropriate pain medication. And this is what happens here. And um, the, the uh, regular way to apply this chimeric 1418 in, in these trials here is uh, to give it as an, a daily eight-hour infusion. Um, in the COG trial, for example, it is four times, uh, so it's on four sub subsequent uh, days of 25 milligrams per square meter. Uh, and then in the SIOPN, we had five times 20 milligrams per square meter. But all these um, infusions are eight-hour short-term infusions. And um, what happens if you do it like this and if you give appropriate pain medication such as IV morphine and you still have a patient that suffers pain, what you can do is you simply decrease the infusion rate of the antibody. And then uh, you, you are, uh, it is possible to, uh, to manage uh, the, um, uh, the pain toxicity profile much easily. And this um, observation we, we basically took forward and um, addressed whether it is possible to, to, um, to further optimize uh, this pain <coughs> side effect by using the same cumulative dose of chimeric 1418, uh, but not give it uh, in five days, but in uh, 10 days uh, via continuous uh, infusion and ask the question whether we can improve uh, upon this uh, particular uh, toxicity side effect. But at the same time, we want to make sure that we also achieve immunomodulation so that we can achieve the activation of the immune system as we uh, as we intend to with this type of treatment. So this is the, um, uh, the treatment schematic that was um, used in order to pilot uh, this idea. And <clears throat> it basically um, has um, three elements. We have the continuous infusion of the chimeric 1418. And we combine this with uh, subcutaneous interleukin-2 uh, with two rounds, followed up by 13 cis retinoic acid. And, um, we um, did this first in a single center experience set up uh, in my institution, and now we have an, also an open 
phase one two clinical trial, which is a multi center in Europe and it's also running uh, in, uh, in, in uh, um, UK um, centers, uh, but also other countries throughout Europe. What I'd like to share with you is the information that we could gather during uh, this um, single center experience. And we did um, quite an extensive uh, parameter investigation along that treatment. We first looked at the pain toxicity profile uh, with uh, this particular treatment approach, but also looked for the immunomodulation uh, that we achieve with this type uh, of treatment, such as um, looking at, at certain immune assays um, to show that this treatment is active against neuroblastoma. Um, and we look at the pharmacokinetics um, with this particular treatment. And we also look uh, at the response and certain characteristics of patients that um, um, uh, you can divide into two groups with a, a good affinity uh, to the antibody and one uh, uh, group with a, a low affinity to the antibody and ask the question whether there's a difference uh, in the event-free survival, which would then give an idea uh, whether um, the immune response is really doing uh, its job as we uh, suspect it uh, to do. So this is the first uh, piece of information related to the, uh, to the pain toxicity. So we looked for the usage of IV morphine. We always start with a standard dose, which is uh, 30 micrograms per kilogram uh, per hour. And what you can see here is that already in the first cycle, it is possible to dial down the IV morphine. And with the antibody still running, it is possible to um, uh, decrease it to, to amount that uh, you can actually discharge the patient uh, with still ongoing antibody infusion. And this effect um, is uh, even better on cycle two and cycle three and cycle four and uh, some patients where we have six cycles, we, we didn't even give any morphine anymore. And this is uh, just looking at some pain scores uh, along that treatment. Uh, so uh, if we um, if we grade the pain of the patients, uh, you see that uh, there is something going on related to pain toxicity, but it's um, way below a threshold of three where you would actually intervene by some um, additional measure to, uh, to treat uh, the pain. So it's quite uh, interesting to see that by giving a 10-day continuous infusion with this antibody, you can improve the pain toxicity profile uh, of this treatment. Um, there is an impact also by IL-2, and this is uh, um, a very s a short, um, a small group of patients that we looked at uh, giving this antibody without IL-2, but also continuous infusion. And uh, we can see that uh, this absence or this reduction of pain is even more pronounced if you don't have to give the IL-2. Uh, so th these are two cycles, and you see that there's only one patient that we actually needed to give some morphine on the first day in the second cycle, and then there was, uh, it was not necessary to give this this pain medication at all in contrast to the, um, to, uh, to the bigger cohort on the, on the left side. So it's conceivable that uh, without IL-2, uh, it's even easier to apply uh, this type of treatment. <coughs> now, if you change um, the way how this antibody is applied, of course, one needs to make sure that you achieve also sufficient amount of antibody in the, in the patients. And we know that uh, from in vitro studies, um, a critical amount of antibody that you need in the serum is one microgram per milliliter. And uh, on the um, x-axis down here, you see the entire treatment period of uh, about six months. Um, and um, if we look at the uh, drug concentration in all the cycles, we stay way above this one microgram per milliliter, clearly indicating that we have an efficient uh, drug level uh, over the entire uh, treatment period uh, with, uh, with this application uh, mode, which is important. Another interesting fact is that um, when we compare uh, the five-day application with the 10-day continuous infusion, we also see that um, when we compare this blue curve, which is the 10-day continuous versus the short-term red curve here, uh, that the area under the curve is much bigger for the blue one, which indicates that the exposure to the antibody seems to be improved when you give it over 10 days compared to the, to the five-day application, which is also um, interesting um, and surprising that with the same amount of antibody, just giving it over a longer time period, you get more um, exposure out of it um, with uh, less side effects. Now, when we look at the complement activation, uh, which is one of the mechanisms how the immune system kills the neuroblastoma, we can also see a very interesting effect, which is that uh, over the entire treatment period, we see an increase of that activity over time, uh, 
So it never returns down to zero. So you have to acknowledge that this is a sample taken before starting the next round of antibody and it's still uh, quite uh, effective, uh, which also shows that over the entire treatment period uh, we have an, an active uh, immune response against uh, neuroblastoma uh, in these patients. This is just another way to look at it. So this is a whole blood cytotoxicity assay where we uh, combine the cell and the serum uh, effect against neuroblastoma and there's the same uh, basically happening. Uh, so we have, um, if we look at samples just taken before the next treatment cycle, we see strong activity against neuroblastoma which keeps to build up uh, over time, uh, which is uh, encouraging to see that um, uh, the treatment is, is lasting for, for uh, half a year. Uh, this is a slide just to show the GD2 specific effect. So if we have these samples and we add an, an uh, inhibitory molecule uh, to block anti-GD2 antibody, which is an, an anti-idiotype antibody, we can uh, show that uh, these uh, uh, responses go down to zero, which is simply um, a, a way to show that this is clearly a GD2 specific immune response uh, induced uh, with uh, this treatment. Now, we talk a lot about the, um, the immunomodulation. Uh, we also certainly uh, tested for the response uh, to this treatment in the relapse refractory setting. And um, in, in this uh, cohort of 53 patients, we had 40 patients that had detectable disease in any examination, so MIBG, bone marrow, uh, CT, or, or MRI scans. Um, and out of these um, 40 patients, we had 12 which showed a response, and we have uh, seven complete responses and five uh, partial responses, which is an overall response of, of uh, 30%. And this was assessed according to the INRG uh, criteria that were applied uh, to uh, assess it. And uh, these are the, the survival curves. Um, they don't mean many things, but uh, because we don't have a comparator, but uh, what we can actually uh, do is we can uh, create two groups of patients, as I mentioned earlier, uh, where we define um, a high affinity of the FC receptor to a low affinity of the FC receptor. And you can see that um, the uh, patients that have a lower affinity do not so well compared to the patients with a high affinity, indicating that the um, uh, recognition of the antibody by the immune system uh, is an important mechanism uh, to mediate uh, this response in, in the patients, which is basically a proof uh, of concept that the antibody is uh, the, the most important agent in this uh, uh, immunotherapeutic approach. So this is what we learned in the relapse refractory setting, and I'd like to share with you uh, some information that uh, comes out uh, from uh, the frontline use of this chimeric 1418 antibody. And uh, this relates to an ongoing um, uh, trial uh, within the SIOP N group. It's called high risk NBL1. And um, in this um, trial, there has been uh, two important uh, questions uh, implemented. The number one is, is a little bit gray because it has been answered already, which is the uh, mega therapy question uh, related to uh, BUMEL versus SEM. Um, and the second important question related to uh, the use of um, chimeric 1418 in the presence and absence of uh, interleukin-2. Uh, here are the criteria uh, to include such a patient uh, into the randomization. And um, this shows the schematic of the, of the treatment. So we had uh, a um, um, short-term eight-hour infusion implemented in this trial combined with a um, first week uh, of IL-2 without antibody and then combined with antibody, and the second arm received uh, no additional interleukin-2, but the same amount of um, chimeric 1418, and of course the standard of care is a certain cis retinoic acid. It was also implemented uh, to this treatment. And you have uh, seen this slide already when it was shown by Donna Lodunzi. The, um, the uh, surprising result to us was, uh, is shown in, in this particular slide, where we did not see a major difference between uh, patients that receive the combination of anti-GD2 with the cytokine versus uh, the antibody alone. And uh, here is the two-year event-free uh, survival rate. It was uh, for the whole cohort 0 0.6 or 0 0.58, so there's absolutely no uh, statistically significant difference between these groups. Um, and I'd like to also uh, briefly mention that 
the patients that were eligible to receive the immunotherapy were not only complete response patients, but also patients that had a partial response. Uh, so it was also interesting to look into uh, subgroups, um, which um, can be separated into two parts, which is, um, sorry, first of all, the complete response uh, group. Uh, also here, there is no difference between anti-GD2 with or without IL-2, and also for the VGPR, the PR group, no difference between um, anti-GD2 uh, plus minus um, IL-2. Now, um, the, the interesting part is that, um, and, and, and this is very difficult, uh, um, and I would like to take this with, with big caution, but anyway, what you can do is one, one can look at the numbers at two years um, of the group of patients within the SIOP-N uh, that had a complete response entering into the trial, which is at, um, um, with, with, um, um, without, with, where the antibody alone achieved a 67% plus minus 6% uh, two-year event-free survival. Um, and, and, we, and we look at this side here, um, which is published by um, uh, 2010 using the um, SP20 antibody, th there is not much of a, of a difference. But the interesting part is that also with IL-2, it's not different. So it seems that IL-2 doesn't really play um, a major role. But again, this is early data. One needs to be careful. But at least the signal coming from that graph is that the IL-2 doesn't seem to be so important uh, uh, in, um, in this uh, type of immunotherapy. But it contributes clearly to side effects. So if we look at the um, at this forest plot here, um, and if, if you have a um, yellow column shifting to the right side, uh, it, it shows that um, the, the side effect profile is worse. And it, it's very clearly uh, for the group for, with anti-GD2 plus IL-2 compared to anti-GD2 alone. So what, um, what is clear is that with addition of IL-2, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, side effects here. So um, this information taken together, um, when we um, go back and uh, um, uh, have a clear signal that giving antibody in long-term infusion is, is more tolerable, and also the fact that IL-2 doesn't seem to be such an important cytokine, um, it, it shows the conclusion that was made within the group to um, to continue the IL-2 question, uh, but in combination with the long-term infusion setup, and this is the future plans for the frontline high-risk neuroblastoma trial. So we, so we have the continuous antibody application over 10 days, um, and still combined with IL-2, but the dose of IL-2 is uh, uh, reduced to 50% in order to, um, to improve also the, um, the side effect profile here, um, and have this randomization uh, against long-term infusion of antibody, but without uh, interleukin-2. So this is um, now in some countries already approved and open and running. Now, um, this IL-2 question also feeds into uh, the plans related to the relapsed refractory patients. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have the long-term infusion study that, um, uh, that has uh, this particular part, um, which, uh, which has been run as a single arm study and since we have now this information from the from the frontline study we, we added a second arm where in the relapse refractory patients we also have uh, one arm where the IL-2 is not given and ask um, in this particular situation um, a similar question what what's the role of IL-2 uh, in this particular long-term infusion setup. Now Besides uh, open uh, clinical trials, I also would like to share with you some strategies that uh, may eventually be of uh, interest related to um, the treatment after anti-GD2 immunotherapy. And uh, one of these strategies is shown on this particular uh, graph here. Um, and it uh, makes use of um, the fact that um, we, we, uh, we should think about ways to induce an anti-GD2 response um, in the patient so that the patient can produce his or her own anti-GD2 antibody uh, following a vaccination approach. And there's several options that can be used in this respect. Number one is to use the antigen by itself and immunize. Uh, 
but uh, there we have the problem that, uh, that there is a carbohydrate structure uh, which is poorly immunogenic and uh, it's very difficult to raise a good immune response against uh, the glycolipid by itself. Uh, therefore, um, it, it is more successful to, uh, to find protein structures that mimic the ganglioside GD2 and therefore uh, are good antigens to induce a, an, an antibody response in a patient. And one way to do this is to use a so-called anti-idiotype antibody, uh, which is uh, an antibody that um, fits or that sees specifically the binding site of the nominal antibody. So this is chimeric 1418, and uh, this here is an anti-idiotype to chimeric 1418. And if you use such an anti-idiotype and you immunize a patient, um, you can get um, a humoral response against the anti-idiotype, which is then capable to see the uh, GD2 antigen again, which is expressed on the, on the tumor, and thereby achieve a long-lasting uh, humoral memory response uh, in such a patient. And this, um, I think, is a strategy that, um, that um, we are working on uh, and hopefully create something that, that uh, is possible to be applied after uh, infusion of uh, chimeric 1418. But I'd like to just briefly summarize. So um, we, we uh, could learn from, from the high-risk neuroblastoma study that the addition of R2 doesn't uh, show a clear value at this time, but we can clearly uh, see toxicity. Um, we can also show that um, giving the chimeric 1418 in a long-term infusion setting combined with R2 shows uh, clinical activity in a relapse refractory setting. Um, and um, at the same time achieve a reduced pain toxicity profile with this long-term infusion regimen. Now, if I think the, the R2 question, although we have a signal, uh, is not really 100% clear yet, so there's ongoing uh, studies to further address this issue in, in uh, clinical trials, um, and um, it will be interesting to see uh, how, how this evolves um, and, and what the final answer will, uh, will be. Um, at the end, I'd like to briefly acknowledge there's lots of people that, that are involved in this work, but I'd like to simply show this, uh, this um, picture. This is Ralph Reisfeld, who was the uh, person who actually made the um, um, mouse version and finally also the chimeric 1418 antibody uh, that we are studying now in the clinic. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.